One of the things we produce in the department is a, th is a common infections handbook, and uh, we'll, we will put that onto the, uh, uh, onto the link when this thing goes up, if we can, uh, because it's got pretty well everything that we're going to talk about today, and it's quite handy. Uh, most, most of it you'll know, but I know for myself from time to time I just have to look up, you know, what is the drug and what is the dose for gonorrhea sort of thing, because those are the things that change. And Arlo is very, very um, helpful. Uh, she will Sometimes. Act, she, she, sorry? Sometimes. She, uh, she updates it. We've always had um, somebody from the laboratory update it. So um, uh, if you teach medical students, they will all have a copy of that book, but it's designed for a bunch of people. This is going to be those of you who saw the, the webinar with ProCare. This is essentially the same content. We apologize for the bad sound that happened on that one. We never found out the reason why the sound was bad. It doesn't seem to be bad anymore uh, on our webinar thing. So um, if you were able to hear that, then this is going to repeat of it. So you might want to go to something else. But other, other than that, we're here. Uh, I was going to say my conflict of interest is I'm on the Pharmac Education Committee. Um, and uh, we do work for Pharmac. My views on restricting antibiotics really have nothing to do with that. They, they predate that um, by going uh, by, by a long time. And Arlo, what your conflicts of interest? How I do think, I make this work? I think, I think it's working. Is it yeah. working? Um, well, I guess I work for Lab Test. It's a private company that's owned by HealthScope, um, which is publicly listed in Australia. Um, and we have a capped budget. Well, we don't have actually, we don't have quite a capped budget. But anyway, I guess I have a conflict around um, not having too many excessive urines coming in the door each day. Um, that, that would be my conflict. Thanks, Chris. But I guess at a meta level, and all of us in here, really, we, we really don't want to waste medical dollars, do we, on unnecessary drugs and on unnecessary tests. So, um, so let's go. OK, urinary tract infection. Take it from here, Arlo. Well, I think this is a really difficult area at the moment in terms of the need for the MSU. Um, hopefully I'm correct in saying that BPAC last looked at urinary tract infection and uncomplicated urinary tract infection in 2006, and the guideline at that time was in uncomplicated urinary tract infection, um, do a dipstick. If you know, Clinically, it looks like it's UTI. Do a dipstick. If the dipstick confirms, just treat with trimethoprim. But our trimethoprim resistance rates in Auckland are sort of 25 to 30 per cent. And it's an unanswered question as to whether trimethoprim is still the right thing to use because resistance rates do not actually necessarily indicate um, clinical improvement with the antibiotic. So for example, we say sometimes with some organisms, if they look in the lab like they're amoxicillin resistant, sometimes amoxicillin can work, not for E. coli, but for other, things like enterococci, because it gets very high levels. And so we haven't really been able to establish whether that advice around trimethoprim as the first line treatment for empiric therapy is the right advice or not. We're trying to do a little bit of work at the moment. It's interesting, we've asked some GPs to send in an extra code when they're sending in a urine for those people, those women that normally would just have got empiric therapy. And what's, Gary, my colleagues, looked at a sort of an interim analysis of the first 100, and what's interesting is actually only 50% of them had a urine repathogen isolated. So it's a little bit hard to know. So at the moment, the advice is still that for uncomplicated UTI, you don't necessarily need to do an MSU. Because your resistance rates overestimate, don't they? Because they're not, uh, because you know, who do we do midstream urines on? We do them on patients who are having complications, recurrent infections. So you're, getting, you're selecting for a subpopulation who've been exposed to potentially a lot of antibiotics. We think that, but to be honest, because we've never been able to actually look at resistance rates in uncomplicated UTI, we, mm. we suspect that, but we don't know. Well, Les Toop did that study in Christchurch. I don't know if it was published, but they found it was about 10% when mm. they, they looked at mm. women who not really had first first attacks mm. or mm. hadn't done things. And it so, makes sense clinically, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, so you have to be a little bit careful when you read the resistance rates. And in the back of that booklet, in fact, you just sent us the latest ones, there is, we have the resistance rates um, in the back of that book. So that will, that will be online somewhere uh, in future. OK, so antibiotics. Uh, the, the one I struggle with is nitrofurantoin because patients feel nauseous on it. And I, never, I, I tend to give lower doses for shorter periods of time 
it seems to work. Well, that's good. Um, but, you know, because it says five days, seven days, and I, I, mm. it seems to me that mm. way is way, way too long. Well, I think one of the problems with nitrofurantoin is that we don't have the 100 milligram BD slow release tablet here in New Zealand, and so patients are having to take the 50 milligrams four times a day. And I think that there's a lot of compliance issues because we often see relapses or poor response to therapy, particularly in ESBLs, where the patients had nitrofurantoin. And I think, but I don't know with the 100 BD with the slow release, would they get less nausea? I don't know the answer to that know, question because we've never had it here. No. But in Europe, nitrofurantoin is first line and it's used very successfully, um, but that, that's with the 100 BD. So I think mm. nitrofurantoin, I mean, almost everything's susceptible to it, which is good, but I think that there are those patient mm. compliance and happiness with the drug issues. Now, there are a few little issues here. I had a gem about the adverse effects of nitrofurantoin. It's not, not recommended now for prophylaxis, is it, because no. of the, the, the interstitial lung problems. There are 50 cases in the last 10 years where ACC have had to compensate people mm. for lung, which I, when I saw that figure, I, I, had, I had a million panic attacks because I had one patient on it. And there's actually an acute situation which people will get. So you need to advise patients if they get any respiratory things that, that so there's an acute situation well, my understanding is there seems to be an acute, mm. there's not much about it, it's, mm. it's hard to find. There seems to be an acute situation you can get, and then people on long term low dose, although it's effective, there is this risk yeah. of interstitial, and we've got no idea to how to quantify that. So. Yeah, and I personally, as the people who have spoken to me on the telephone know, I don't actually approve of low-dose prophylactic antibiotics. I think outside of PEDS, and I'm not going to speak for PEDS, you know, children with abnormal urinary tracts, but outside of PEDS, like for the elderly women, I think that you're asking for more. And it's, it's nice to see these non-antibiotic um, preventative things like the stand out there coming available um, and hopefully having some clinical evidence to back them. So the... Um, anti-adhesion type things, so trying to get away from antibiotics into uh, other preventative things. And I want to thank you for being available by telephone. Um, I was at a meeting once on rheumatic fever and Arlo was trying to come into the meeting. Her phone went off 10 times. It took her an hour to get That's in the room an because somebody would be phoning her up and she actually just couldn't. I just remember you, you opening the door. It was a very up. unusual Friday. Yeah, yeah. And so, a bit of an so, but I think it's fantastic. I know my colleague Tanner Fishman just loves being able to phone up the lab and, and, and get help. I think it's just uh, it's often the most common phone call that into mm. the pharmacy that we make, and it's uh, it's it, and I don't, I don't think that exists in other countries. So I think it's fabulous. Um, specific antibiotics. Oh, when to avoid? avoid. Well, I guess um, we're trying to move away from the quinolone, so Norflox and Cipro. Because of the issues, I mean, no one denies that they're fantastic drugs. They are fantastic drugs, but we like to keep Cipro for when you need it. So when cystic fibrosis children need it or when elderly people with a gen genuine pseudomonas problem need it. And if there's been a lot of Cipro being used in the community, the resistance develops very quickly. So um, ciprofloxacin should only be used in pyelonephritis. And um, I said to Mark, I said I was looking at the, at the program yesterday, I started firing off emails. Dear Mark, can you please tell the GPs in your pyelonephritis talk to write it on the form because otherwise they won't get the cipro susceptibility. So we don't, and I sent Ed an email. Dear Ed, can you please <laughs> tell the GPs? So, um, so avoiding cipro, that's an antibiotic stewardship thing. And then I guess, um, avoiding, uh, and also obviously in pregnancy in children, and avoiding trimethoprim early in pregnancy. Okay, pyelonephritis, any thoughts on, on, on that? I guess just that from the laboratory perspective, um, pop it on the form and then you'll get the ciprofloxacin. And I think if someone's sick, I think hydration and ciprofloxacin is the best treatment. If mm. someone's less sick, you could maybe use cotrimoxazole, but I think the guidelines actually say cipro first line, don't they? Oh, I can't remember, but I mean, also most people, I think it's, rec unless they're fairly stable, is, is to admit them anyway, um, is, is the thing. Postmenopausal woman, any, any suggestions there? I think, and I've had a lot of discussions with GPs on this, because obviously I'm sitting in my office with my feet up and you guys are in front of the patients, and it's two very different scenarios. Um, I think it needs a good conversation with the patient about what the risks are, because the risks of um, 
of actually going septic are very small. Um, what are the actual symptoms and how much are attributable to the presence of the bacteria? Because we know that our older women, particularly the sort of more 70s and 80s, and women who are in rest home facilities often have bacteria. It's a common finding. So discussion around the symptoms, discussion of non-antibiotic management of the symptoms, and um, and obviously estrogen creams. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's a terrible thing to say, but I don't think God meant for us to live this long. I mean, I think it's a really difficult problem for elderly women, but I don't think that all these antibiotics are necessarily the best thing in the end. So discussion around risks and benefits of antibiotics. I think it's one of these areas of medicine that we need to really talk to the patient and also, as you've mentioned in the past, Bruce, get an idea about what's important to the patient and what symptoms are really the most distressing for them, but not always go down the route of antibiotics. You treat the patient, not the, not, not the urinary culture. Mm. John, I don't know, can, did you go through Auckland Medical School? So John Carmen was our professor of anatomy, those of you who went through Auckland, he said the problem with human beings is we're only meant to live to the age of 25. Oh. So <laughs> I was about 25 at the time, and it just seemed a bit, <laughs> a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit of a long term down. Uh, any comments on indwelling catheters? Um, avoid. Avoid. Okay. <laughs> so, again, so with indwelling catheters, we only report sensitivities when those urines get sent in if it says fever, because bacteria where someone's got a long-term indwelling catheter is actually only supposed to be treated if they are systemically unwell, and that should also be at the time of removal and exchange of the um, catheter. So within, well, the studies show that within two or three days of an indwelling catheter there they become colonised with bacteria and biofilm forms on that and you will never ever 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 clear it with antibiotics. So anytime someone's got a urinary catheter in and you're thinking about antibiotics it really is not good medical practice to give antibiotics without a new catheter. Fantastic. Um, just a take home message there. Uh, you're making me all the way. Um, we get a lot of urine, and I personally think that it's probably over-requested. Um, I think that samples that are eat, we get more urines than CSFs, and I just mean that's because it's less painful to get CSF to get urines. That obviously, it's not the only reason. Um, so I think that once you've done the urine, and like in those groups of people like indwelling catheters and elderly women, who half the time will have bacteria, or with the catheters they'll always have bacteria, once you've done the urine and you've got that bacteria in the report, it's very difficult not to treat, and so I think actually sometimes requesting the urine actually leads to unnecessary antibiotics. So I think it's not the first question is not should we give antibiotics for this result, I think the first question is do we actually need to do a urine here. I have a solution to this problem. We should, uh, you should only accept suprapubic uh, yeah. um, aspirations yeah. of, uh, of, uh, of the bladder. Can you imagine the phone calls that I would get? That, that, that would slow, slow me down, that's for sure. <laughs> that you'd get none from me. Okay. Okay, so, um, uh, I mean, I, I, to me it's transformed practice, um, being able to get patients to sell swab. Mm. I had this slightly terrifying moment where this 20 year old woman, I, I gave her the swab and I said, you need to do the self swab. Expecting her to go out the door, <laughs> she ducked behind the, ducked behind the curtain. <laughs> There I am in this room with a 20-year-old woman, and she's doing a self-swab. Um, I didn't have a chance to get a chaperone in, and it was all done by the time she came back. So that's my, uh, that's my uh, downside. But I think it's transformed the way yep. Um, yep. we do this. We do a lot of schoolwork, mm. and it's just fantastic there, because mm. you know those young women aren't going to want to mm. they have an internal exam. Uh, the, the key thing, though, is the patient's got abdominal pain. Uh, it's recommended by the gynecologist you do a bimanual because of mm. the risk of PID and I guess other things that are going mm. on, but I don't know how often that is done. But your, your thoughts on vaginal discharge? Um, my thoughts on vaginal discharge are that you need to write it on the form or you will not get candida and BV results. I guess that's the first thing. Um, and um, I think, so, so with the chlamydia and gono, which is, is actually more STI screening than vaginal discharge, that's currently the aptima tube. And that's, I know it's really annoying for you guys when the tubes change, but the reality is that a lot of those um, decisions are driven by commercial imperative because the pricing can change quite a lot. So we actually can afford to do more of these tests now than we could say 10 or 15 years ago because the prices have changed a lot. So the aptima swab is for the chlamydia and gonorrhea. The trichomonas now also gets done on that aptima swab, but it only gets done where, there are clinic, where it's requested. And we ask you only to request it where 
that the, the person's got risk, which is really, to be honest, Maori and Pacific women, and to a less, much lesser extent men, because it's more a sort of a female pathogen, um, and people who are low socioeconomic. Um, and even with vaginal discharge, you know, in a um, someone who lives in Rimuera, the reality is that they actually vaginal discharge is more likely to be candida and BV, and it would only really be if that those two things are not ruled out that then it would be appropriate to request trichomonas. So that's, um, but trichomonas definitely does cause vaginal discharge. Um, and then with those abdomen swabs, we keep those for a week. We actually, you know, in theory they can be kept longer, but we can't keep them longer because of space issues. But if you've if you've got that situation, you can always call and ask for the, the trike to be added on. So I guess the, the big change that's happened in the last few years is that the routine bacterial swabs, which get a gram stain for BV and a culture for candida, they only get processed with appropriate clinical details because women don't need treatment of candida and BV if they're asymptomatic. Now there's some argy-bargy around pregnancy. There's a couple of, where some people believe that asymptomatic infections do cause preterm labor. And there's, the evidence is quite conflicting, and the Cochrane Review at the moment says no, but there's two good studies that are going on, one in Australia and one in Europe, which should answer these questions. So that may be, in the future, a change around testing for those organisms in asymptomatic women. But currently, we don't test for those um, in asymptomatic women. So I think in the past, a lot of people did pap smears, did a routine STI screen, and did a routine vaginal swab. In a, but no need in an asymptomatic woman. And also I guess the one other comment to say is, in women having pap smears, they shouldn't routinely get STI testing. It still comes down to talking to the patient, finding out what their sexual history is. You know, so it's people who've got lots of partners who are under 25 who have had STIs in the past, yes, routinely screen those women. But people who um, are middle-aged and boring, they don't necessarily need STI screens. And when you do it, and then you get a low level false positive, then you regret ever doing that test in the first place. <laughs> I, I have to regret, I have to say, I, I do regret more often doing tests than not doing them. <laughs> you know, when that liver function comes back slightly elevated, I, uh, I have why on earth that I, we, yeah. yeah. So any comment about the, the treatments there? Um, well, uh, Associate Professor Mike Thomas is giving a talk. Is he, no, he's talking about pyelonephritis. Is he talking about and gonorrhea? gonorrhea? He yeah. is talking about yeah. gonorrhea. Um, he's recently done a paper which has been accepted for publication, um, but is not published, uh, looking at an audit of the treatment of gonorrhea in Auckland, and we're still not always treating gonorrhea as per the guidelines. So remember that the Cipro resistance is really high. It's like 30%. So um, gono gets treated with a 500 milligram one-off IM, and you get well, that on your triaxone. Triaxone. and you get that on your physician supply order. Oh, I'm not sure actually. Does anybody know? Yeah, right. but I think no. it's quite hard for people who, because gono, our gono positivity rates of the samples that we get is sort of 0.9 to 1 percent, so it's actually really low, and this and our chlamydia positivity rates are about seven to eight percent. So it's quite possible for GPs not to actually see much gono ever in their practice. And again, gono in the study that I've done and have not yet published, gono was again highly correlated with lower socioeconomic and Māori and Pacific. So there's definitely groups in our community who are very, very um, at risk of STIs and still under under-managed in terms of diagnostic testing mm. and treatment. Well, we look after three schools in the mm. Manurewe area and we're, we're seeing gonorrhea in these kids. I was mm. a bit horrified, like 15-year-olds mm. with gonorrhea. Mm. Um, you know, in my early career that just never would have happened in, in kids that age. So, so it's certainly mm. there in those high risk. Uh, and those high kids, school. we're doing the trike regardless. So we're doing the trike test in 15 to 17 year olds, regardless of request. And also mm. wherever the gono or the chlamydia is positive, we reflex on trike because we've seen that, that the positivity mm. rates are higher among those groups that have already gotten STI. Our candida rate and our um, chlamydia rates were so high in one school, our, our new registrar wanted to give everybody azithromycin, <laughs> wanted to sort of, you know, w w welcome to the school and here's your azithromycin and a, and a shot of depot at the same time. Yeah, not a so bad idea. That's right. So we thought it would be, be a nice trial, I think. Okay. And then I asked um, Arlo just because the, the, uh, the swabs are uh, Given that I tend to see people 70 years and older, I get a bit confused with all these swabs. But um, do you want to just walk us through the, the different um, ones? Yep. So the first, the orange ones. So this was some idiot at the beginning of lab test tenure decided to change the, you know how normally in the hospital and probably in GP land before we came, the normal bacterial swabs were blue? 
and some twerp decided to change them to orange to be in keeping with lab test colours, which caused no end of confusion. So now I always have to say orange slash blue, blue swab. But those are the candida and the BB swabs. We basically don't do any culture for gono, for women, for female gono. So if you've got a male who's got um, discharge, you can just do a normal bacterial swab and that will be cultured for gono, and then I recommend doing the first catch urine as well. Um, but otherwise, the whole days of doing endocervical swabs in women, the bacterial endocervical swabs in women for gono culture, we don't really look at it. The only time is if there's a specific request because of concern about, um, well, there actually isn't that good a reason to do it. Um, and so the antibiotic susceptibility data, the sort of surveillance data, which is obviously population-based, not person-based, that comes from the male culture. So we do need to keep culturing. So, and then the, um, the aptima tubes are for the, um, the chlamydia gono plus or minus trike, and there's the urine, which is first catch urine after you haven't peed for an hour or two, and you just need to fill it up to between those two arrows, and then the female, and you've got to get rid of the white swab. The white swab is for back in the day when it was um, practitioner collect, and you're doing the speculum exam, and then the idea was that you use the white swab to clear away the gunk, and then use the blue swab, because sometimes that gunk can inhibit the assay, but um, if you just, and so that's where it's important, because if you're telling the patient to down try and do the self-collect, it's got to be the blue one, and then it gets broken off. So it has simplified things, but obviously it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of practitioners that need to you know, learn the new, whenever we make a yeah, change. Yeah, well, it, 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 it sort of changed pretty rapidly. Can you just make a comment about that first forward urine? You said don't, is that, is that the first one when you wake up in the morning? It doesn't, or is it, it doesn't have to be, but you have to have not peed. Some guidelines say one hour and some say two hours. But I guess because the longer you haven't peed for before, then the, the little naughty little cells are collecting at the end of the urethra and then you catch them. But if you've just peed, then you might have just washed them all oh, away. Oh, I see, yeah, yeah. okay. So the, the, so the first void, it's, it's yeah, okay. So. Yes, yeah, so it's actually not necessarily first void, being pardon, it's um, voiding, having not voided for a couple of hours. Yeah, I asked Arlette the pictures. Interesting, you were saying about uh, the early days of lab tests. Um, I must congratulate you on having a very, uh, very smooth operation, uh, having been one of the ones offering antibodies to you when you first, when you first arrived. <laughs> well, that's funny. That, that, I was at the Metro Governance Group the other day, and Alan, I said, to, you know, I was presenting something, asking about a change, and Alan said, "Okay, Alan, we'll do this for you, and you can have, and you do something for us." And I was like, "Oh, yeah, what would you like? More collection rooms?" And I thought that's much harder than what I'm asking you guys for help with. <laughs> So, now this is on our website, and I think our website is not that well utilised, and it's, being, it's going to be changed in the future whereby it's going to be an area that's going to be um, practitioner only. Um, but anyway, all the stuff is on the website as well as the antibiotic susceptibility, ta susceptibility tables. I was actually at the front of the march. When oh, the, uh, I was on the march too. <laughs> what, what, against the new lab? because I was working at Auckland Hospital at that stage and I was there supporting There's Susan. a great photograph of Tanner Fishman and I there standing with our microphones. Um, it, it, sort of, it, was, it took us back to the Vietnam days, but, uh, but yeah. it, was, uh, it was nice to go on a march. I, I sort of missed the, missed the adrenaline <laughs> that you get out of those things. Okay, so PID, and, and uh, I guess, I mean, it's a hell of a thing to diagnose, isn't yeah. it? I mean, I don't know, um, it's a whole... It's a whole session it's in an, itself, isn't it? And I just think you look for the STIs. We do accept vaginal swabs, but even if someone, I don't know, I think it's very, so you, you look for um, the gono and the chlamydia and the trike if they're an at-risk person. That's yeah. what I think. Um, and I guess if they have got BV, then you would add metronidazole where you might not otherwise into your treatment regimen, but it's difficult to diagnose. Because actually quite a lot of things can kind of cause a bit of discomfort in the... Oh, well, there's a lot, a lot of organs down there, you know, mm. yeah, gut things, uh, muscle, muscle things. Mm. I mean, there's just all sorts of things. I mean, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I always think you, you know, obviously it exists, but whether, whether we can detect it. Mm. I think even the gynaecologists have mm. trouble because um, when I talk to them about it, they say, you know, that's a whole, whole one hour lecture mm. type thing. I think mm. it's actually, and even when they look in with a laparoscope, I think yeah. even that doesn't, interesting, that doesn't help. You know, it's not, uh, um, but clearly some people do get, do, do get PID, but, um, whether you can diagnose it prospectively, um, I'm not sure. Mm. And as you say, it's probably more important to get the swabs and go, mm. go that way and then sort mm. of think, well, the pain may have been, if there was lower abdominal pain, um, then that could be. Okay, epididymitis. Um, 
I don't get very many calls about this, um, but I guess it's the age groups are always less than 35 think about STIs and more than 35 think about enterobacteriaceae, but I suspect that that doesn't actually reflect the Tinder generation and the Grinder generation. I mean, there are men who are over 35 who are up to all sorts of things, and so again, I guess testing is testing is important. And I guess the only sort of differentiation for the 35 is whether you empirically treat for UTI-based causes mm. like E. coli, or whether you empirically treat for STI. And I guess that comes down again to the clinical history, which is why we're doctors, right? Absolutely. Well, I understand that in Florida. Uh, and all the retirement people there, and Viagra, they've got they've got these sort of epidemics of sexually transmitted diseases in the uh, the uh, the uh, retired population. So um, so people are never too young. Well, my hairdresser's mum died the other day, and her parents lived lived in one of those villages mm. up in Orewa, and she said. The day after the funeral, the women were inviting Dad round for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there some advantage of being an elderly male? I, I can I can see it coming. So, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, sexual health screens. Um, yeah, but I think very important in younger men presenting with mm. epididymo or chitis, Something I've never been able to spell or say properly. Um, and I guess, I think the empiric therapy that you go, the path you go down does depend on the sexual history to an extent, which means that we have to take a sexual history. And I can sit in my office and tell people to take sexual histories, but when I did clinical medicine, I was terrible at it. But the, um, yes, the um, sexual health nurses do a course, they were telling me, mm. to help um, the non-sexual health practitioners come up with good ways of mm. asking it. Mm. Yeah. A, lo a, lo a lot of it's about the narrative you use. and. Uh, and having those sort of difficult conversations. I was just talking about it at the fact workshop yesterday about asking difficult questions. You, you have to just go in. If you, look, if you look uncomfortable about it, you're going to make the patient feel very uncomfortable. You, yeah. you just have to yeah. go in, you know. Um, if you're going to ask a sexual history, boom. If you're going to ask about suicide, boom. Just, um, just, just, just go in because mm -hmm. if you hesitate, you're lost, basically. So, Okay, urethritis. I think urethritis is an area that's quite interesting. Is that missing an R? Urethritis. Yes, but, um, yes. Yeah, my spelling. Sorry. Um, it could be mine. Um, so mycoplasma genitalium is the big thing that we don't look for currently in the community, and I am hopefully going to work on doing some reflex testing for mycoplasma genitalium because it definitely causes urethritis. So the sexual health guys will test for it in men who have got symptomatic urethritis, who are CT and NG negative, and who have failed a course of azithromycin. The problem with mycoplasma genitalium, so when we did the study that we did at the end of last year that I have not yet published, but some of you guys have seen the data, um, about, and it was, we tested mycoplasma genitalium on all the STI, all the chlamydia gonorrhea requests that we had. I think it was about 5% overall positivity rate, 4, four to 5%, so it's definitely out there. And it's kind of considered chlamydia light. So it's usually about three quarters of your chlamydia prevalence is MGN, and it's kind of like three, 75% th of the clinical syndrome, if you know what I mean. So it's similar clinical syndrome, but not as bad. So, um, but the big problem with mycoplasma genitalium is we think from overseas studies and very limited studies in New Zealand that up to 50% are resistant to azithromycin. And that makes treatment in the community very difficult because the drug of choice is uh, moxifloxacin that's expensive and you guys can't access it. Mm. So that is, and, and then so I guess what I'm trying to say in a roundabout way is there's other stuff that causes urethritis that we're not looking for at the moment. So mycoplasma genitalium, and then you know like adenoviruses, obviously herpes can cause it. For men who have sex with men, um, enterobacteriaceae, so your gut, your gram negatives from your gut can cause urethritis, but that could be picked up on a swab or urine. Um, and also for people having unprotected oral sex, pharyngeal organisms can also cause urethritis, but again, those would be picked up, although we wouldn't routinely look for H flu. So as sexual um, practices change, then there's actually a lot of different organ groups that can contribute mm -hmm. to infection, mm -hmm. and we don't know that on the laboratory request mm -hmm. form. So, um, but the mycoplasma genitalium is, I think, a big thing, and it's, you know, you go to the infectious diseases conferences and STI conferences, that's the big 
sexy topic at the moment. And our assay, the Aptima assay, can test for it, but we're not paid to test for it. But as I say, I'm going to um, hopefully organise so that we um, do reflex testing on men and women with sterile pyuria for which we have an abdomen tube. So it's kind of syndromic testing. So, and I think it's okay morally because the GP's already done STI testing, so we're just looking for another STI mm. within that. Mm. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to get that started within the next three months, and we would do it for a period of six months and then review to see if it was worthwhile. So the rule will be anything's possible. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's true. Um, Moxifloxacin, is, I think that has been given IV, is an oral drug? It's oral. Oh, okay. But I, when I looked last time, which was years ago, when it first came out, it was like $400 for a tablet. It might have come down in price, but because it's used for um, bad Legionnaires' disease in the hospital. Right. And it's used for this, and it's also used as a, um, a treatment for TB, that's multi-resistant TB. Mm. We used it in this guy that had this multi-resistant TB in his head. We, um, they, they put this thing in and we used to inject, when I was a registrar, we used to inject antibiotics into his... Mm. Mm. Do you know about that guy who died in Wellington from multi-resistant antibiotics? What, what he, was it a skin infection? There's a, there's a program called Peak Antibiotics and oh, I yes. had a small slot yes. on it. They and, cut me out. Or oh, did they cut you out? Yeah. <laughs> they, they film me for hours and they show you for about a minute. So, but anyway, you got a minute. I got a minute. Um, and this, the sister of the guy who died in Wellington said he used to write letters to her and say, this is a great place to live. Every time I get a cold, I can go down to the local pharmacy and buy the antibiotics. Well, this guy developed a multi-resistant mm. organism, ended up in Wellington Hospital, and after four months died. Um, and so there's a big, you know, yeah. sort of the, the irony of his uh, being able to buy his antibiotics for his colds. Um, yeah. I think, um, so he must have been in Asia, and I don't know the details of that case, but it must have been skin soft tissue joint. But there was a case in, um, a couple of years ago at Middlemore of someone who I think it had to have been in India and it had some kind of ghastly accident um, and had a very multi-resistant organism causing infection in his leg. And he had, you know, they usually have other problems like diabetes and end-stage mm -hmm. renal failure and so that, the immune system looks good. The surgeons amputated his leg trying to save him, but he died as well from mm -hmm. sepsis. So, mm -hmm. um, and I think, remember in the Gulf War, the soldiers used to come back because they used to go from the Gulf War and then to Germany. But I think it was thought they picked up that really resistant Acinetobacter in the Gulf and then the German military hospitals just had these massive outbreaks of these incredibly resistant mm. germs mm. and these young people with the wounds and things. Mm. So really quite sad. Yeah. We, we, we may end up working in an era with antibiotic resistance again, eh? So, um Okay, so we've done urethritis. Okay, so. ST epidemiology. Oh yeah, group. so this is the, these are the data that came from that study that I mentioned before. So we looked at um, just over two and a half thousand requests for chlamydia and gono, and you can see the overall prevalence. And I think, just I'll talk briefly. Um, you can see that men are much more likely to have a positive result than females for everything except for trike. And so I think that that is a reflection. I mean, obviously men do behave very badly, but it's also a reflection on the fact that <laughs> <laughs> that, um, that the women get tested left, right and centre. You can see that females with 2,200 female tests to 431. So we need to get men being tested more. And look at the Māori and Pacific rates. So that was, um, we used the census data to get, um, to get positivity rates per population. Um, the Māori and Pacific rates are really alarming, and when I was writing the draft of the paper, I found a paper from 1965 or something that was about gonorrhea in New Zealand, and it said, oh, the rates of gonorrhea among the, the local Māori people is astronomically high. So that means that we, it's essentially a 50-year public health failure, to be honest. And um, I think we need to somehow move healthcare into the community more effectively to get education, testing and treatment in these groups. Mm. So men in Māori Pacific, um, so all these white middle class women in Remmers having STI testing with their smears, mm. we need to take that resource and shove it out to Manurewa. Well, and, and just a plug here for the school, so we look after three high schools in Manurewa, James Cook, Manurewa and Alfriston, and we support the nurses there. So if you get a chance to support the local high mm. school nurses, there's just a lot you can do. So we just put a little bit of resource in. We, we now get funded for it. We did it without funding for a few years. 
and that amplifies the resource. You've got access to a very mm. high-risk mm. population. So if you're interested in that, come and talk to us about what we do with the schools, because it's, um, it's very satisfying. Our registrars love going into the schools. They mm. go and do the clinics there. Um, it's, it's a really, uh, it's an amazing, that was done by Karen Hall, who's a paediatric nurse practitioner in our clinic and a partner in our clinic. So there are some, so in, in, t in answer to your challenge, uh, that's one <laughs> yes, way to get, yes, no, well, yeah, fair, absolutely. Fair, fair, I mean, you're seeing it, Yes. Um, and, and you have that view, so if you can challenge us to do that, so. Um, th uh, what is MG? Oh, that's the MG, and that's Mycoplasma genitalium. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you can see that. Um, wow. Yeah, so you can see, yeah, overall 5.1%. Mm. Um, and then you can see that in trike, overall 3%. And prior to introducing the molecular technology, we were doing culture for trike, and our positivity rates were less than 1%. So that mm. shows you the difference between the sensitivity between molecular and that culture. So how do you pick up the trike in men? Is it on a swab or urine? A swab is better than urine. Mm. Um, but urine will still pick it up, but swab is thought to be it's the preferred specimen because, and in fact, the, the, the male testing is not FDA approved, mm. to be perfectly honest, but mm. we still, we, are, we do do it. So if a woman request. gets trike, we should treat the man as well? Treat the man, yep. I guess I've always done that, but I haven't seen a case of trike no. for a long time. No, Problem of dealing with 70 year olds. So. Oh, yeah. Okay, take home message here. Know your epidemiology before testing. And, um, What's a net swab? Can you tell us that's what a nucleic net... acid amplification test? So that's like, you know, we think about PCR, but PCR is just one form of nucleic acid amplification test. Um, the one we've used is so complicated that I couldn't describe it to you. Okay, um, but that's the coverall for that diagnostic method. Um, and I think we've covered those other things. It's team. always interesting how you do need clinical. It's a bit like with chest x-rays. I talked to a radiologist mm. once. I said, oh, you've got a great job because you've got the gold standard. He said, no, no, we have to, we have, to have the history. Mm. You know, can't interpret mm. a chest x-ray without a history. So I thought, mm. well, that's interesting, eh? So M MG is, uh, we may get an MG. Mm. Always, always want an MG, but not that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so common cold. So this is getting into the my area. territory. Yeah, yeah. So uh, antibiotics are no use. Essentially, we, we've known that for a long time. But if you want to say to patients, if the patients say, "Well, you used to give me antibiotics, doc, and now you're not wanting to," you say, "Well, actually, the latest evidence would suggest uh, they make no difference." Randomised trial of 10 days of augmentin, for God's sake, for coloured sputum made no difference. This is in people who present with a cough and coloured sputum, no clinical exam, um, and about one in a thousand of them ended up in hospital whether they got antibiotics or not. So very, very, and that's, that's the group we're seeing. And I, my suspicion is most people get antibiotics in New Zealand for, for coughs. Mm. Um, and I think what you have to do is say to people, it takes about four weeks for a cold to go away. I always decrease expectations and we don't want to do anything until you've had it for, for four weeks, and by that time, it'll go away. Um, nasal or oral decongestants. Now, it's a real pain getting the controlled drugs prescription out for some pseudofedrine. Mm. Unfortunately, that was changed by, by RIT. To reverse that's going to require an act of parliament. I've looked into it, and I don't think any parliament's going to want us to be able to prescribe methamphetamine. I mean, the six tablets I give to my patients, which cost them, you know, ten dollars or whatever, um, isn't going to be turned into methamphetamine. The methamphetamine's coming in from China in a hundred thousand dollar tablets, but no parliament's probably going to. Uh, they're probably going to legalise marijuana before they let us prescribe oral get decongestants, which is nuts because that they the decongestants do work. They're the only things that really work when it comes to colds. Um, but it's such a pain in the neck to prescribe. But I mean, I can, you can say to a patient, I can make you feel better by tonight if, you want, if you're willing to take this. Take an antibiotic, it's probably not going to do anything. Um, I'm trying to get nasal decongestants funded. And it was quite funny because I sent the stuff to Pharmac, who I'm a big fan of, and they said, well, the evidence is they may not be any better than placebo. But I said, we're giving antibiotics to all these people, <laughs> and we know that's not better than placebo. I mean, you know. Let, let, let's give a placebo that probably works. And if you take one of those nasal decongestants, you know they work because you can breathe within about sort of 10 seconds. Um, you know, uh, Ipratropium is funded, so the Ipratropium nasal fray, and it does work for rhinitis. Um, the non-steroidals and paracetamol, um, actually the evidence around those isn't particularly good, interestingly, but Vicks in children gives the parents a better night's sleep. So, um, uh, and if you're a parent, you'll know what that means. Um, 
Sputum is of no value, really, is no. it, in, in the community? No, and we get, I don't know how many we get, but we get a reasonable amount, and there's actually quite a lot of subjective looking at the plate going, uh, should we report that or not, anyway. Um, can I ask you about cough? Mm -hmm. So do you ever use steroids? Uh, not for, oh, uh, only if they're wheezy. So you wouldn't give someone 20 milligrams of prednisone for five days for prolonged cough? Uh, pr probably not in the first instance. Okay. There'd have to be some other contextual. Reason. I do give it for sore throats, so. though. Oh, do you? Mm. Right, mm -hmm. actually, the Cochrane Review uh, actually shows that um, uh, with or without antibiotics, it does seem to uh, reduce, like if somebody's really bad. I mean, yeah. it's, yeah. not the, it's the patient who comes in and says, oh my God, I've had a week of antibiotics and I've still got this terrible sore mm. throat and I can't stand it any longer. Do something, then I'll give 40 milligrams 40 of prednisone. For five just days. once, no, just, just once. Just once. Oh, yeah. interesting. And Cochrane Review, yeah. Yeah, oh, good. Yeah. So it is something, it's a sort of, it's, it's a last ditch. It's certainly not something I do for everybody. Um, but, you know, some of these viral things, actually, the, the worst ones are the viral ones, really. Mm. The, 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 I mean, the strep makes you feel sick, but the, the actual pain, the pharyngitis, is worse with the steroids. NNT of about three or four, so it's actually. Yeah, pretty good. Um, with Compared to most things we do. <laughs> um, with respect to sputum, I would almost go so far as to say, I'll see if you agree with me, that you shouldn't really send in sputum unless someone's got an infiltrate on X-ray or that they've got, you know, because I know that you don't always get an X-ray, do you? I mean, that's another no. resource issue. But no. you know, if someone you Picasso or here, um, but I, I, yeah, I think pertussis is a nightmare, and I think that we that primary care is very poorly served by the laboratory with respect to pertussis, and I saw the, um, you know there's that weekly thing that comes out from ESR, mm. and it's last week, it's, or, you know, the week just gone by, it said that the pertussis cases are ramping up, and we're actually one or two years overdue for an epidemic, so this might be the year, but I think pertussis is a nightmare, because by the time you're sort of saying, is this pertussis, they've already infected everyone, they're sick to death of it, they want an antibiotic, an antibiotic's probably not going to work anymore anyway, and um, the diagnostic tests are no good, and serology is useless, and we're talking about getting rid of it. So um, I think pertussis is a very, very difficult situation. Well, it's good for us to know, I think, because I think we struggle with it too. And I think if you're struggling with it, well, that, that makes me um, feel a little bit better. Uh, one, one of the lines I use the patients when they come in with a, with, with a cough or a cold, I say, is there something you were hoping I could do for you today? Because I've had the patient come in uh, all they want is a, a note for work, and I go through the whole antibiotic thing. You know, <laughs> ten minutes later, they say, oh, "Can I have a note for work?" You know, um, so I like to I, la I like to get that because if the antibiotic thing comes up, um, then I know I've got a problem. I have to emotionally <laughs> get the energy. It has to be early in the day um, to take to take on somebody who's got the super tanker momentum. Um, uh, because you know, some people get completely medicalised. We we took over a practice of where, where everyone got antibiotics, and eight years later, those people still want antibiotics. That's interesting. They still, and I see their code number. I know they came from the other practice, and um, uh, you know, my heart sinks basically. And it's pretty hard to get out, the, get them out the door without an antibiotic or a complaint or or, or something, you know. <laughs> but 25, 50 percent of New Zealanders are getting an antibiotic every year. And I don't think any of you in the room could justify, not, not you personally, but I don't think any of us can justify that. In Europe, it's about 10%, and the Dutch think that's too high. Um, and we're going to end up with a situation where they don't work, and then we're going to, we're going to lose a very valuable tool. So the issue... So acute bronchitis is an interesting thing. It actually doesn't exist as a condition. You've never actually seen anybody with acute bronchitis. It's an umbrella term for a group of people with respiratory symptoms. If you look at the Cochrane Review, the people in those studies have asthma, so they have lower respiratory tract signs. They have a cold, so they have a cough, but no lower respiratory tract signs. They have COPD, some have lower respiratory tract signs, or they have pneumonia. So if you take a bunch of people with that umbrella group and give them antibiotics, you do get a small benefit. But of course, the colds aren't getting any benefit, the asthmas aren't getting any benefit, some of the COPDs will be getting a bit of a benefit, and most of the pneumonia, well, all or most of the pneumonias will be getting a benefit. So, and the antibiotics seem to only work in actually sort of uh, elderly institutionalised people uh, or older people, and I suspect some of those have COPD. So, um, the old joke used to be, Acute bronchitis is when a, a, a doctor wants to prescribe an antibiotic for, <laughs> for a common cold, you know, sort of um, acute bronchitis amoxyl we used to see on the cards in the old days. You have to write a bit more these days. 
Um, but um, uh, if they're wheezy, I think they need, they need uh, steroids if or, 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 or treatment as if they've got bronchospasm. I mean, if they're very, very sick and febrile, then you might want to give antibiotics. But I have to say, I don't see many people like that. Mm. You know, and I'm thinking pneumonia. I probably want a chest X-ray on that person, and/or I might be sending them through to hospital. Um, so yeah, so not antibiotics for. Um, I mean, I rarely give antibiotics for for anything respiratory. Um, uh, acute sinus symptoms, commonest cause of antibiotic given in the United States, um, and it's very hard to diagnose bacterial sinusitis clinically and certainly um, not in the first week. Um, technically, this, the, the first column there, the first line there is about uh, one way of diagnosing bacterial bron um, sinusitis, facial pain, nasal discharge, dental pain in the upper, upper, upper teeth, and failure of a nasal decongestant. So that's usually my thing. If a patient comes in with a cold and I give them a decongestant, either pseudofedrine or xylomatazoline and or um, epitropium, and they've still got pain, then I would possibly give that person antibiotic because their pretest probability of a bacteria has gone up. But lots of people turn up with colds and a bit of pain here. Um, and um, uh, so it's mainly viral and pressure. So if you relieve the pressure, you can make the patient with acute sinusitis feel a hell of a lot better in a couple of hours. Uh, with, um, I'm a little bit careful about using uh, decongestants in older people, so it's usually in younger people, because there was one where there was a risk of stroke, phenylpropanolamine. Actually, there was, a, there was a stroke risk with it, and they are, they they do sort of put up the blood pressure a bit. So I'm a, I'm I'm judicious. The the nasal decongestant I think is fine. Um, I think that's a good thing, and I'm still pushing Pharmac to try and get that funded, because it would give us a positive alternative. Now, the other thing I do, we have a little thing called a common cold sheet in our, in our clinic, and it says, take time off work. I'm very keen to get people to take time off work, because they think you're a nice guy. But I mean, you don't want them going back to work and passing their bug round. I remember I had influenza in my first um, run in general practice. I was working at the Herne Bay Medical Centre, and I went, I went, I staggered into work, and I literally gave it to everybody. Mm. I wiped the clinic out mm. for ten days mm. because I, I had got mm. it off somebody else, and I staggered in because I, you know, I couldn't take a day off work. I was a staunch doctor, um, so I get people to take time off work, wash their hands if there's something to do, um, take analgesia, uh, consider decongestants put antibiotics don't work, so they can read that. Um, it's got about 10 things That's in it. No and it's actually, I think it's on, on, on the podcast I've done on, um, I'll check that on, on the podcast I've done. So it's giving them something positive rather than you can't have mm. an antibiotic. It's all that marketing thing. It's where our marketing skills, waving your arms, this stuff. <laughs> have work. we got marketing skills? Marketing, you, you've got to market this stuff, you know. Um, uh, Intranasal steroids, possibly for acute uh, uh, for, for, for sinusitis. I'm pretty, um, um, and in the US, 80% of people get antibiotics, which are considered unnecessary uh, for this condition. So um, again, you've got to start training your patients. And it's difficult if all the doctors in your clinic don't agree, because um, if you've got somebody, you become the guy who isn't, isn't, isn't the good doctor. Well, you know, so-and-so gives me this, um, and you've got, you've got a bit of a struggle. So you really have to have a policy, and it's interesting, we had a discussion around the coffee machine the other day at the clinic with people getting very interested in, in being a bit more united on our antibiotics. And we run an Augmentin free office. If you want to give Augmentin, you have to ask um, permission of somebody else to give Augmentin. Because uh, it's a great drug, but you just, you know, there are 700,000 prescriptions a year on augmented. There were 1.4 million prescriptions in the year 2000. Unbelievable. Um, and I had a medical student with me one day, a fifth year medical student, and I couldn't be bothered going to get a colleague, so I said, oh, would, you know, can you give me permission? He said, no. <laughs> give flu clocks. Okay, well, I can't give augmented. I, I, couldn't really, I couldn't really overrule him and go and get somebody else. And he, he felt really chuffed, actually. He thought that was pretty good. So it's a story I tell to, med to medical students, and they, it gives them the sense of power and entitlement that uh, they got Bruce to stop that thing. Um, so there's a second sickening, I think. 
I have to say, I don't think I've really ever seen this. Um, you know, people who sort of get this and they get better and they get worse. But it's in all the textbooks, so it must exist. Or they're very toxic. Now, beware of that. There are some, you know, people end up in hospital with abscesses in their ethanoid mm. sinuses and things. They can get, you would have seen this in your day as an ID, Reg, wouldn't you? Um, antibiotics, perhaps only if the symptoms have lasted 10 days or more. That's the sinus pain thing. Um, and there's a debate about how long you should give antibiotics for. Uh, the new stuff with pneumonia is actually five days, and if mm. they're stable, stop. The, the symptoms at that point are, uh, and cellulitis, the same thing. Um, so are you a three-day, five-day, or seven-day prescribing doctor? And we would have, we'd have the audience all divided up here. The rule is it's, it's uneven numbers till you get to 10 days, and after that it's even numbers. So it's three, five, seven, and we would divide you all up, and then it's 10, 12, 14, 20. So, and every time I do that with an audience, there are three, five, seven day ones. It's just how human beings like to count. So it just reminds us that we're all humans. Uh, which antibiotics? Well, probably just the regular old ones, amoxil, oxy. Oh, that's amoxyl, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I tend to prefer erythromycin, uh, roxithromycin to erythromycin. Yeah. It just doesn't have that gut Same problem. Same gut problem, that's right. Yeah, and it does seem to be effective. Well, certainly for skin infections, yeah. it's effective. Um, oh, okay. pe people, people think it's not, but... Um, uh, but um, as Liz Toop says, if you give 10 days for everything, you're never going to know if someone got better in five days. If you give five days and they're not getting better, they might come back. Now, my bet is most people don't take five days of antibiotics anyway, which is actually good news because the, the new thing, if you talk to Mark Thomas, is you don't finish the course of antibiotics for most things in primary care. There's no need to because most people don't need them in the first place is the first issue. Mm. But secondly, um, you're bathing, you know, you're bathing the, the, the normal bacteria in, uh, in antibiotics. So if you give them 10 days for every pneumonia, you're gonna, they're going to get five days they don't need. It's like the um, meningococcal epidemic in Rod Pegler and Mark started the treatment. So overseas and all the guidelines were for meningococcemia or meningitis to I think 10 to 14 days of IV penicillin and they did the study of three days and Rod always used to say that the meningococcemia was dead after one dose of IV antibiotics. He said one sniff of, one one, sniff, one sniff of penicillin yeah. and um, meningococcus now, is dead. <laughs> may I make a comment about sinuses? Please don't send us nose fobs. Please do not send us snot and please do not send us bogeys. We will not process them. We do not. So the only nose swab we process... Actually, do you know what? Sending in nose swabs is a nightmare because we don't know, like some people can have a cellulitis or a boil or something on the outside of their nose, that gets dealt with differently. So there's that thing, so then you should write, you know, cellulitis, because that gets treated as a skin wound. Or if you just do a normal bacterial nose swab, we just assume that's for Staph aureus carriage. But nose swabs, because you want to work out what's causing the sinus, it doesn't help you and we don't process those. So the only ones we accepted are those sort of fine things that the ENT surgeons, where they actually stick something back with a machine or something. And some people honestly do send bits of bogeys. Well, we, we have the, well, you'd be surprised what gets brought in for us to yes. see. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, you get these people who've got things on their skin. Um, they're, they're really challenging, you know, like I'm sure... Oh, those people are sad. They need to see psychiatry. Oh, absolutely. We, we, we terrible had a, for we those, had a, we, yeah. we run of them, actually. We had about mm. three of them on the go at one time. And, uh, Apparently they're know, very difficult pretty, to manage. Yeah, I actually re recommended a naturopath to one of them, oh, that's actually. that's a good I idea. I thought, I, I said, I had to do that. I don't think we're the doctors for you because we don't seem to be able to mm. help you. You may want to find some other doctor who mm. can help you. No, that's, I think, um, a good idea. Which is, well, sometimes you can't. Sometimes they do mm. need to see somebody mm. else because, you know, your sympathy is running thin and, um, uh, you know, you're not going to fix them. Over your research, so antibiotics are discretionary, virtually always, rather than mandatory, other than strep throat, uh, pneumonia, uh, or patients with severe symptoms, or children with otitis media under the age of six months. After that, it's always discretionary, basically. So I think that's the choice point for us. We need to, and most people are give, given antibiotics for symptoms, not diagnoses. I've got a colleague in Britain who says, the rule should be you only give an antibiotic if you've got a, a bacterial swab, which of course <laughs> wouldn't work for cellulitis probably. But I thought actually that's not a good, that's not a bad sort of discipline for us to keep in mind. I mean, some things we can't get, get swabs for pneumonia. There's a whole lot of things, but that would, that would slow us. So most people in New Zealand get an antibiotic for a viral reason. 
So we're giving antibiotics for viruses and we know they don't work. I mean, I'm talking to the converted here, otherwise you wouldn't be here in the room. Um, if if they can get, uh, give a short duration, particularly if you're going to give a back pocket, because if you give a back pocket prescription, you're saying to yourself and uh, subconsciously to the patient, I don't think you need antibiotics. They so don't give them five days or seven days, give them three days. And they're probably not going to take the three days anyway. Um, I've gone off back pocket prescriptions, even though I did the, one of the, the original studies. I think you just should be saying no. You know, there's no evidence for this. You don't go to your lawyer and say, give me a good deal on tax. So why should patients be able to come in and say, I want to have an antibiotic for this because I've always had it. And you think, well, actually, there's no, there's no indication for why you had it. You know, I think it's part of our being a professional. We just have to stand our ground sometimes. And these aren't easy consultations. I know if you're tired at the end of the day and run down, it's easy to write the prescription, and that's OK. But that can't be your modus operandi. We, we have to. And it's us that are doing it. You know, it's, it's not our hospital colleagues. It's actually us that are doing it. And I think we've got to we've got to rise to the challenge. Acute otitis media, so... Um, 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 I, and yeah, I, I don't get very many calls about this. We do see swabs, and I'm not sure that they're useful, but mm -hmm. and this is what the paediatricians say, so... Well, ear swabs aren't particularly useful, are they? Like for chronic no. training ears. No, no, no. no um, and no, no, there's no, no, no indication no. for that usually. And we get quite a few of those, actually. Yeah, yeah. And oral antibiotics don't, aren't usually a first point of call. I think we've actually got some slides on that, so I want to just go just next. Um, now, I was listening to Emma Best the other day, yeah. and she was saying, so with people well, who've had a lot of antibiotics, sorry? We're out of time, are we? We should have had a clock, yeah. Um, <laughs> and he was told he had to stop talking, and he turned to the audience and said, everybody who wants me to carry on talking, please put up their hand. And 3,000 people put their hand up, and so he carried on for another 20 minutes. So, <laughs> but I have Nikki sitting there. So. <laughs> How are we supposed to I do wonder whether you want to take some questions. It's been a brilliant talk, and thank you very much. But it's, okay, we've got questions? time for a couple of questions. So um, there are some... Um, What's the problem with having two people who to talk them? too much? That's right, we've talked too much, sorry. <laughs> Any Not questions? at all. You've been great. <laughs> One up the front, there's a microphone here if you want to use the microphone. Yes, can we have your question? Yes, um, just some quick guidance on taking throat swabs. Throat swabs. Because people, people come in a lot and they want throat swabs because mm. they're worried about mm. Yeah, unintended consequences of a public health campaign. Interestingly, among Pākehā and Asians, who are very low risk for rheumatic fever, the number of throat swabs that we've received in the last five years has doubled. So there's definitely is a push in the community. I just, um, well, I'm terribly blunt, so I'm not the right person to answer the question. Bruce is probably the better person, but I think it's just that you're not at risk. Viruses cause, particularly in older people, the majority of sore throat. And also, you don't want antibiotics. That's why I always say you don't want antibiotics unless you really need them, because they make you fat. Well, there's a little bit of evidence for that. And they give you thrush, and they give you diarrhoea, and they mess up your bowel floor, and, and you have to kill, eat sauerkraut. And they kill at least one person every, every other year yeah. in New Zealand. So I would just say, you know, um, this was a focused public health campaign and um, it's quite like it's a virus. And Emma Best actually told me that there was a Cochrane view, I haven't read it myself, but even with a positive throat swab culture, treating it actually only reduces the, the symptom duration by about 18 hours. Yeah, it's less than a day. So sim symptomatically people are getting very limited benefit. Um, so I think sometimes you could say to somebody, well, you haven't got a life-threatening illness, would you like a life-threatening drug? That's what an antibiotic is, it's a life-threatening drug. And doing the throat swab, I think, leads to the antibiotic. And we know that, in theory, half of the positive group A strep cultures are colonisation. So we're treating colonisation, we are treating colonisation for sure in this programme. So I guess it's just, again, like the antibiotic conversations, just having that conversation with the patient and readjusting their expectations because they've got misinformation, really, from the public health campaign. Um, children three to something, 18, 18 Māori and Pacific and people who live, it's almost always Māori and Pacific or people who live in um, like, is it decile one? Qu I always or get quintile, quintile five. Yeah, so that's the two poorest, two, two poorest um, deciles. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically the people in South Auckland who are living in, or Porirua or Northland who are living in massively crowded conditions or Māori and Pacific.
um, or people who have had rheumatic fever in the past, obviously. Uh, maybe people can come up and talk to us afterwards, Absolutely. Ross, if you want to call the session to an end. I, d I don't want to call the session to an end, but it has been fascinating, and I do uh, want everybody to show their appreciation for a fascinating talk. Thank you.